Okay, get me down here. Well, let's get underway. Uh, I'd uh, like to welcome everyone to this um, seminar of the uh, Australian Student Christian Movement, and we're uh, absolutely delighted to uh, welcome Dr. Brian Howe, a former uh, Deputy Prime Minister and uh, senior friend of uh, the Student Christian Movement, and uh, and also uh, Dr. Ian Weeks. Uh, who's uh, a colleague of Brian and a uh, distinguished uh, religious uh, scholar. And uh, the um, the topic is, uh, has the uh, secular university had its day? And uh, I'd uh, like to uh, invite Brian now to uh, address us initially on, on the topic. And uh, and we'll then invite uh, Dr. Weeks to respond. Brian, thank you. Well, thanks very much, uh, Robbie, and uh, thanks for our friends of the uh, Australian Christian Movement uh, for joining uh, in this discussion. It's all pretty historic, I suppose, because if I think back to when I was president of the Melbourne SCM, I think that was 1960, so that's uh, 62 years ago. Um, and a lot, a lot's uh, passed since uh, we worked with John Adams and Janie at uh, Cura in Fitzroy, and before they went off to Kerala, I think, and uh, all sorts of uh, wonderful work uh, uh, there. Uh, so it's nice to see some familiar faces. Um, I'm going to talk, uh, I hope, to the topic, although um, being a politician, one always tends to redefine the question and uh, uh, and and. Uh, <laughs> Find your own <laughs> and that's what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to find a starting point, but in a way, what I'm trying to do is think a bit more strategically because the issue of the secular university has been around for a very long time and religion has always been placed in the university and if it's there at all, it's, it's in a second class kind of status. It's uh, not seen as part of the real university. And of course, that uh, stands in such contrast to the student Christian movement, uh, which in my day at least uh, talked about the idea of the university as uh, itself uh, a search for truth, a search for a kind of deeper understanding, moving away from perhaps sometimes conventional religion, uh, perhaps a bit creative on the theological side, but at the same time, uh, uh, it encouraged discussion on campus between students. That was extraordinarily vital. I mean, the great conferences of that period were fantastic, and uh, uh, the people who were uh, influent, who spoke at those conferences, uh, were uh, leading Australian intellectuals, but often uh, Australians that uh, were playing a very important role in public life. And so, I suppose my cut on it is a bit uh, political in the sense that I'm trying to think about how do we put this issue of the secular university. And I, I'm not thinking particularly about what the word secular means, although I suppose an assumption there of what I'm saying, that I think the, uh, the, uh, the, the secular in a sense means something more than neutral. It means uh, uh, it has something about a kind of rationalizing about a, a kind of view of truth that, uh, that limits truth uh, in quite significant ways and limits issues uh, in ways that uh, are not sufficiently broad and don't really recognize the breadth and depth of humanity. And universities play such a crucial role in building uh, society, uh, especially Australian society in this case, has been largely uh, uh, shaped by universities. Renata's uh, book, uh, uh, which was the history of the SCM from its foundation, uh, uh, really emphasised the people of influence. And uh, I remember we had some discussions at the university about uh, uh, whether that book uh, really was talking to something real. And uh, the historian we talked to at the time uh, was saying, oh, no, no, that's kind of rubbish, you're making that up. But when you thought of SCM people that you knew about, you knew they were there in the public service, they were there in politics, they were there in economics, they were uh, in the community doing all sorts of things which reflected the values that uh, helped to shape them in the student Christian movement. So has the secular university had its day? 
Uh, Jason Clare, the Minister for Education, uh, recently opened a consultation or opened what would be a consultation on an Australian university's accord that will build a long term a long term plan, he said, for higher education. The first review since the Bradley Review in 2008. The Accord panel will make recommendations that meet, he said, current and future needs of the nation and sets targets to achieve this. It'll engage extensively across the higher education sector and so on. The terms of reference will focus on knowledge, skill news, needs, access and opportunity, investment, governance, accountability. You know, in a sense, uh, uh, in that terms of reference, there's kind of a limiting, a sense of being reduced to the worldview of uh, politics, the worldview of uh, public policy, didn't seem to ring tight true with what was happening in the Australian community. Coincidentally, this review is being conducted uh, at a time that Ben Davis, former Vice-Chancellor of Melbourne University, now the person in charge of Prime Minister and Cabinet, had published on the subject of higher education very recently. He has very clear ideas on the need for change policy environment, policy framework that embraces the entirety of post-school education, institutions focusing on specific field of human knowledge and move to greater diversification. It'd be surprising if the minister was not interested in his priorities, uh, Glenn being in such a crucial position. Davis is surprised by the similarity of culture in Australia leading public universities, or as some of the less dominant universities, experimental tribe very strongly interdisciplinary, and Renata taught at Deakin University, and they really pioneered uh, distance education in Australia. And they also had an extremely, you know, it was terrific. I mean, Renata wrote uh, all those study books, which I've just uh, been giving to the archives, and it seemed like dozens of study books that she wrote for distance uh, education, didn't quite have the technology then it does now, but it was extraordinary. And the topics uh, were also very interesting and creative and very, uh, I suppose, very um, relevant to the time that they, uh, Matthew Charlesworth, uh, I think, uh, was an extraordinary professor who uh, uh, really developed a university with a very distinctive style at that time. I think Anne Weeks uh, would agree with that very, very strongly. Uh, Deacon had its own style, its own culture, and it made a very important contribution to Australian universities. I notice in these reviews, thinking of the, uh, the official review that's going on and uh, the work that Davis had done, it's assumed that the Australian economy is uh, changing post the digital revolution, but there's little or no reference to the changing character of the Australian population. For example, it's very obvious that the population is aging rapidly, whereas the University of the Third Age is grossly underfunded and for the most part ignored by all levels of higher education. There is no reference to changing racial composition or its changing ethnic character as we pursued high rates of migration for the last century, with now India and China being the leading sources of immigrants. I'm going to put quite a bit of emphasis on that because I think, in a sense, uh, Australia in the post-war period uh, uh, was uh, very much reliant on Europe and it thought very much in Eurocentric terms. And I think uh, that was very important. Uh, and, uh, you know, at the time, uh, the Cura, the Animus family, uh, people remember, uh, we thought about that and we thought about the need to develop a much greater diversity in the way that we thought about population change. And we needed to recognise in Australia that we're becoming a very different society that needed to embrace that complexity, uh, that different culture that came to Australia. And this would produce a much more vigorous and a much more outward-looking Australia. And uh, part of that work, I think, uh, Cura, the Centre for Urban Research and Action, set up by the church, had a big influence on the uh, actual development uh, where you helped to write. I remember Des Dora went and helped write Al Grasby's speech on multicultural. 
So I'm very influenced by that. I'm thinking, well, that was a sea change in Australia. It meant a great deal. It meant much to, uh, in many ways, change a lot of the Anglo-centric foci that existed up to that, uh, that point. So I was saying that there's been a little reference to Australia's changing racial composition or its changing ethnic character as we pursued very high rates of migration with now China and India being the leading source of immigrants. We made a mistake 50 years ago by failing to recognize that our migrants were people, not just workers, rather families entitled to have their contribution recognized as being important in building Australia as a multicultural society. Of course, post-war migration emphasized their European origins as opposed to temporary migration in Asia, also with different regions and cultural backgrounds, much less influenced by Christianity. So I'm trying to say that I think it's very important to recognize, you know, that uh, when people want to celebrate uh, Australia as Western culture and all that, well, that they think of that continuity between Australia and Oceania, as it were, are still a European nation. But uh, Alan Walker, I remember in the Mission to the Nation, uh, in the early 50s, in 1953, talking about how Australia had to come to terms with Asia. And that was amazing. When in 1953, Alan Walker was talking about that. And Alan Walker was a very important uh, kind of uh, person who represented uh, the capacity to develop uh, prophecy in a way, to develop a sense of uh, what are the key issues that are facing Australia. And when he was in the United States, he would preach in the South on the need for uh, uh, for uh, equality for people on racial backgrounds. And when he was in uh, Africa, he uh, he uh, spoke strongly against uh, apartheid. A very strong voice at that time. And he recognised and he saw that Australia had to be part part of Asia. You know, before Herb Feith really went. I mean, Herb Feith. I was just reading his biography. What a fantastic SCM Peter was. Jewish background, always battling, in a sense, never quite deciding where he stood between two faiths, but at the same time recognising how important Indonesia was to Australia's future and how important it was not just to go to Indonesia, but to understand Indonesia. I mean, he starts off by learning uh, at the same time as he's learning uh, Dutch, in this Dutch colony, he's also learning Indonesian. And he's recognising he has to speak on equal terms with people. And he needs to uh, recognise, in a sense, the danger of any kind of paternalism and working to form a kind of developmental movements uh, that were important in Indonesian nationhood. So I thought that uh, it was very important, of course, that we now recognize different cultural and religious trends that are important objects of study in this increasingly complex settler society. Australia has been very slow to learn how important language, religion and culture is to our indigenous people. Surely the same applies to new settlers. So important to the future well-being of Australians. And one might argue that Australia we're not especially focused on the study of languages culture and religion in the Asian region. Rather is the evidence that the study of humanity, languages and religion is declining in Australian institutes of higher education. The secular university is increasingly the servant of the growing economy, maintaining a technological edge, not building a more humane society. Osman has made the distinction between hard and soft secularism Seeing in Australia and India and Canada the softer version, as opposed to France, where there is a harder exclusion of religion from education, from universities. However, in Australia, our secular universities stand in contrast to the aid provided to religious schools. I'm wondering whether the suggested university accord might allow for a revised understanding of the importance of religion in the light of the increasing migration from Asia, especially from China and India. Cosmo notes that the Indian constitution stresses the coexistence of all religions, 
Well, Cosman sees Australia as an example of soft secularism when it comes to universities. The reverse seems to be the case. Public universities on the surface have taken a very hard line against religion while offering a few courses with religious content in individual subjects. I think it will be important for Christians to argue that as Australia, with its increasingly complex society, should review its secularist approach to tertiary education, which implicitly denies the importance of religion as being an important influence on culture. If religion and culture stand together, religion is deeply embedded in the culture of Aboriginal people, and it's inseparable from understanding who they are and who they would be and who they've been over centuries. And that same thing is true of people from different countries in Asia. Their history is associated with their religion and their culture is built often on the basis of insights that have been drawn from religious understanding. So the reasons for hard secularism exist in Australian universities are surely out of date. Churches are no longer in the power game. You know, the notion of a church and state, I mean, church and state are now very hard to define as an issue in a pluralistic Australian society. It's just very hard to work that out. The churches are increasingly irrelevant. And uh, in a sense, they are relevant politically, but in another way, of course, they are still quite fundamental to people's beliefs and understandings. We need universities that are multicultural in their ethos as opposed to being in secular ignorance. Questions of belief, what you believe and why, have never been more important, which is why students should not be shield, shielded from questions of faith and the ground of being. I think the church is really uh, uh, a part of, the, part of this problem, I suppose. I, I don't want to spend time on this, but uh, it just seems to me that the churches have have had a great fear of the university, a great fear of the intellectual inquiry. They, they wanted to separate questions of belief uh, from uh, uh, questions of reason and questions of understanding. Now, that was the great thing of the, about the SCM, the student Christian movement. It was fundamentally based on the principles that Herb Faith grappled with, but at the same time, it expressed that commitment to social justice and to building a more humane society, which was an enormous influence, not only on the university, but on Australia. The student Christian movement has nothing to apologize for its history, together with the association institutions that you know were important, along with the SCM and building change in Asia. But we're reaching a point in Australia's history where we need to come to terms with Asia much more existentially than was the case with Alan Walker, much more existentially. We need to recognise that you can keep going flying over to Europe or you can go to Bali and all that and ignore everything else. But you know, in a way, we can't do that anymore. We need to understand that now in a much more physical, geopolitical cultural sense, we are increasingly becoming part of Asia. And I think that's a, it's a kind of that big point. And why it's a bit, and why, that, why I try to make that big point uh, in this context, because I think uh, if we're going to get uh, uh, a fairer deal for uh, religion and religious studies and so on in Australian universities, then we need to tie our demands, if you like, to a cause that is part of that larger picture. And that larger picture that's emerging from Australia is that we're becoming part of Asia in a much more existential sense. And that will present huge challenges. We already have an extraordinarily complex society. No, I don't, I don't think there's another country in the world whose society is so complex uh, particularly if you think of the future, think of it as, as, as a dynamic changing society. And so in that very dynamic changing world, changing society, it seems very important, uh, very important that we uh, engage. So at the very least, it seemed to me that, uh, you know, Justin, I haven't met uh, Jason Clare. Um, 
But it seemed to me that Joe Sinclair ought to be interested in a conversation about some of these changes and that we ought to at least uh, be raising with him because uh, his inquiry, uh, like so many inquiries, is about uh, building a stronger Australia, a more economic and so on. But in this case, uh, this is uh, a more fundamental issue and one which is, which I think is fraught. I think that uh, uh, we're all constantly be telling to how, how well we've done with our migration and uh, we've got the people of Monash. Now talking about how you know, Australia stands up on social cohesion, et cetera, et cetera. But we're now entering into a period in which the, the problems of maintaining social cohesion will become much more complex, especially if what we're interested in is not just social cohesion, but building a more tolerant and a more humanistic Australia. Thank you very much. Got a plane overhead. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Brian. That was uh, a wonderful address opening for us. Uh, I'd like to uh, now invite Ian Weeks to respond. Ian. Um, thank you very much, uh, Robert. And thank you, everyone who's come along here. And particularly thank you, Brian, for um, a lively introduction and summary of what you think are some of the major issues facing us today. Sandy, can you hear me speaking? Yeah. Oh, okay, thank you. Brian, thank you particularly. Uh, with your usual flair and ability, you've taken a series of complicated and difficult issues and pulled them down into uh, issues that uh, can and need to be addressed in so many different ways. And you've drawn us our attention to how complicated and at the same time how simple these issues are. They're complicated. We know that from our study of even our study of Christianity, for example, we know how complicated it is to speak about that in a single voice or a single way. Christianity is not one religion or one faith. Uh, if we think that American evangelicalism is the same as uh, the United Church of Australia, uh, we don't know either. And we are being unfair to the people who have made us what we are. And that is serious that we forget that. And we do forget it. And there are so many different issues that your talk, your introduction uh, raises for me um, that I want to speak to and address. In some ways, um, my own experience in life has been interesting. I went overseas uh, in 1969 and ended up staying away for nearly 20 years. And um, I taught at Yale University and then McMaster University in Canada uh, for those years. And then I came back to Australia to take up a a lecturing position at Deakin University and to prepare uh, for the coming, forthcoming retirement of Max Charlesworth, who had such an important role in constructing the ways in which the study of religion could be done at Australian University. Uh, it was not only at Deakin that Max made his mark, he made it first at the University of Melbourne in the philosophy department. And then uh, he was invited by uh, Pope Paul VI, I think it was, to uh, take on a role of a dialogue with non-believers on behalf of the Vatican. And uh, he spent six years on that. And that led into his time when he came to Deakin University. It's very hard to think of a preparation for his position uh, that would be better and more outstanding than Max's present preparation had been. It was uh, timely and 
profoundly shaped to what Australia is and needed to be. It's, it's very sad, therefore, to see uh, that the inheritance from that um, has suffered the fate of most Australian universities. Uh, Max left a very strong program in religious studies, as well as creating a department for philosophy and a department of the social studies of science. And, and each of those things needs to be understood and thought out as part of our intellectual inheritance and our intellectual responsibility. It's unthinkable that at this time uh, that there could be anyone who addresses the question of religion without also talking seriously about the profound and deep ways in which we are shaped uh, by knowledge, by research, by the research culture of university. And those are things that have been won hard and we cannot give them up easily and we ought not to. It, it troubles me, it troubled me when Brian first came and talked with me about uh, the program for today, uh, that partly the way in which the subject has been framed uh, returns to the opposition between uh, science and religion. And, and of course, there are oppositions there that are important and serious. But there are endless other ways in which the relationship between science and religion needs to be thought out and understood. For whatever might be the weaknesses of it, the fact that the majority of the private schools in Australia are run by religious denominations, mainly Christian denominations, is something that needs to be much more seriously understood by the people who themselves represent religions. The SCM is made up of people shaped not just at high schools, but principally shaped by people who went to private schools. And the private schools themselves have played a major part in the shaping of Australian education. To depict Australian education as essentially and intrinsically only shaped by science misunderstands the enormous influence of religion in shaping the school system, let alone the migration of people from new country, new cultures into Australia. Australia's religion has religion has been shaped by the character of Australia. And so also been conflictual and not just cooperative. Too long it has not been shaped well enough by the fact that we uh, find across Australia an enormous diversity of religion and religious belief. At the same time, when I came back from Canada, I was shocked by the fact that um, Australian discussions about uh, religion mainly turned to the question of whether or not Christian schools and Christian programs would mainly be concerned with turning people into believers of their particular faith or tradition. And, and so much of the language that shaped that was quite shocking to hear that uh, the only issue which could provoke a serious discussion seemed to turn to the question of, is the uh, role of religious education simply one of trying to win over believers? As though that's the only way to talk seriously and thoughtfully about the role of religion in our kind of mixed culture. That, that's a very shallow and thin way to address the issue. And it doesn't do justice to the many significant voices in Australia who have profoundly shaped the nature of religious belief in its many 
different forms and in its growing diversity today. I'm immensely glad and grateful that you placed so much emphasis on the growing diversity of uh, religious belief and religious believers in Australia. Uh, that was a very important part of your speech, and I appreciate that very deeply. But at the same time, we have to be careful not to be downplaying what have been hard-won uh, uh, gains in the nature of religious education and religious teaching in Australian universities. I've given a great deal of thought to, to that, and I must say that part of me is very much shaped by the comments you made and appreciates very much the understanding that the way in which we think of about religion and education has been very narrow, narrow and um, it is not adequate to the reality of what we're dealing with. And I suppose it's that that I wanted to add as a, a different kind of voice to what you had to say. Religion is not the enemy of religion. Religion has always been part of the character of Australian culture. For a long time, uh, from the first settlement of Europeans in Australia, at the time, the First Fleet and onwards, the settlement of Europeans in Australia was profoundly shaped by religion. For almost the first two centuries, the major aspect of the settlement of Christians in Australia was shaped by the conflict between Protestants and Roman Catholics. And to leave that out as though it's not part of the story of who we are and what we are is very sad and very unfortunate. I remember as a sort of voice against that, an SCM conference held up at Chum Creek when for the first time in the mid 1960s, a number of Catholic, Roman Catholic uh, scholars who taught Bible participated in an SCM conference for the first time when Roman Catholics were allowed uh, by the structures of their hierarchy to come out and to participate in a conference jointly with the SCM. Such a threatening devil the SCM was. Um, so it, it, it in fact was a wonderful story that started back in the mid-1960s for that sort of meeting with biblical scholars, also for the first time seeing the presence of Roman Catholic biblical scholars taking part and speaking together uh, and sharing together. Um, that is an important part of our history and of who we are. And to put it only in the terms of conflict or of loss, uh, equally, um, not good strategies for the way to go ahead. However, it's also necessary that we do understand, and um, at times I have been very strongly uh, criticised for uh, painting too narrow a picture about the accomplishments uh, that were brought about by Max Charlesworth and then uh, by what Deacon was able to establish. I say that because uh, I must also say at the same time that uh, in the past week I discovered that the number of people lecturing in religious studies at Deakin is now down to two people. Down from 14 about 10 years ago. Uh, it, it's the last remaining program of any size at a Victorian university. Religious studies collapsed at La Crowe. It uh, ended at Monash University with the retirement of uh, a constant news uh, just over a year ago. And there hasn't been such a program at Melbourne, of course. 
uh, at Victoria University. Uh, I know I went and spoke there several times. Uh, Helen invited me. Helen Hill invited me to come and speak. It was very good uh, to go to uh, Victoria University, but it was also sad to see that the that one of the things that they showed me as part of a proof of how wonderful the program was at Victoria University was that they were starting a movement to establish a building or structure for each different religious community as the way of creating a future for the academic study of religion. I, I thought that was uh, narrowing things a little bit too far and falling into the kind of institutional traps that uh, religion has fallen into in the way in which many Australians think about the nature of religion as primarily and centrally um, an institutional form of behaviour and life. Uh, I tried to address this at one stage in terms of trying to assess my own contribution to Deakin University when I asked the question to Deakin, how many lives of people who studied in religious studies at Deakin have been transformed by what they studied? And I think that it was um, at times very sad to listen to what was said at that time. We saw some of the unfortunate consequences of a largely institutional and political framework of our thinking about the relation of religion and education. And I think that was unfortunate. Uh, it's not necessary that I go on and say much more. I think I've said more than enough just simply to stir uh, some further bits and pieces in our conversation. Uh, and so uh, I hand over now to uh, back to you, Robbie, to uh, conduct this conversation as you uh, would like it to go. All right. Thank you very much, Ian. Uh, really uh, welcome your uh, contribution, adding to uh, Brian's initial remarks. Uh, I'd like to welcome uh, Dr. James Hare, who's, uh, who's just joined us, and also uh, Mandy Tibby. Uh, thank, uh, thank you very much. Uh, and uh, sorry, you, you missed uh, Brian's opening remarks, but uh, we, we look forward now to uh, just a, an open uh, conversation. And so uh, people are, are welcome to, uh, to make comments or, or ask questions to uh, Brian or Ian. Uh, the, my preference is that uh, that people use the Zoom function of of raising the hand, uh, which is under the reactions um, button at, at the bottom. So uh, I'll start off by raising my hand, and um, uh, if if you can't find it, then you can just stick your hand up, and uh, and I'll I'll see you. Um, but um, uh, and if if you want to just uh, Budge in and interrupt, then that's generally okay within the within the limits of politeness. So um, uh, I'm the first one to, uh, to put my hand up. So I'll uh, I'll make a start with uh, with some uh, some comments, and uh, I'll uh, now uh, Brian uh, John Langmore has has clapped. That is is that a hand raise or? Uh, uh, that's that's okay, but uh, I'll just uh, open up some with some uh, some comments. Now, uh, Brian uh, was uh, commented that the reasons for the hard secularism uh, that exists in Australian universities are out of date, and it's true. I, I think this concept of a hard secularism, uh, which is uh, I suppose a uh, an anti-religious um, atheist uh, viewpoint. Uh, it sees religion as socially damaging, and it sees atheism as more coherent and ethical as a worldview than conventional Christianity. And uh, if I can characterise it that way, if Brian has suggested that that sort of a debate is somewhat out of date, 
And it's true, it's an argument from the mid 20th century mm. and uh, the modern modernist ideology ex that excluded religion um, became a default position in much of academia. And uh, those conflicting positions between the secular and the religious were were seen as more absolute in those times. Uh, but uh, I think we're, we're now moving into a time that's more pluralistic and inclusive and accepting that spiritual identity is essential to well-being. And I, I particularly welcomed uh, Brian's placement of this in the context of Australian Indigenous culture. And I think we're seeing in the, uh, the debate around the Indigenous voice to Parliament that the, uh, there's an underlying spiritual and religious uh, context of that debate that uh, perhaps hasn't had the uh, the prominence in the discussion about it that that it would need uh, and uh, so anyway those are just some some reflections um, either if if brian or um, or ian wish to comment now you're, you're welcome or or we can uh, move on to uh, move on to others so firstly brian and, and ian any comments I wasn't going to comment. I thought uh, I agreed with uh, what you what you said, sir. So. Yeah. All right. Thanks. Let's move on to John Langmore. Thanks, Robbie. Uh, I agree with you, particularly uh, about your comment about uh, the, the religious issue coming up in relation to First Nation people. I'm, today, I've been reading a PhD thesis. Uh, on a particular group in the Nor Northern Territory. And of course, the spiritual dimension is very strong in, mm. in uh, First Nation tradition. And, and uh, uh, it's important that that be respected in, in reality. Um, it, it, it's, uh, it's tragic, I think, that the, that the uh, churches were so divided in the, in the uh, 18th uh, century that that uh, the estab people establishing the universities thought they had to keep the, the uh, denominationalism out of them. Um, but clearly, uh, the, the spiritual or religious dimension of, of human knowledge has to be reflected in in uh, in a great many subjects that are taught at university and uh, uh, one uh, dimension for us to to uh, think about and encourage is just acknowledging that in in the courses that are uh, designed and presented at university you can't teach history you, you can't really teach economics you can't certainly can't teach politics. Uh, most of the humanities and the social sciences, uh, without recognizing the spiritual dimension of whatever you're talking about, and and uh, people, I doubt if the uh, secularity, the legislative secularity of university prevents lecturers from talking about those issues in the in the in the courses that they teach and uh and just making that simple point and encouraging people to do it uh recognizes that christianity but also uh, islam and and buddhism and, and many others uh it's essential to 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 uh, reflect that they that they are very influential aspects of many other subjects. Thank you, John. Um, I'll invite uh, Helen Hill to speak. Helen, please. Still need to unmute Helen, please. Yes, that's right. Yes, good. Thank you. Look, this is this is a really interesting discussion, and 
a lot of things have come up here I've been thinking about for a long time, especially even more since I've been been in Timor and looking at the way that knowledge produced in universities is used in development planning and social action and things like this. And uh, I'm so pleased that Brian took us back to think about Herb Feith because, in fact, Herb Feith uh, was probably the person who influenced me the most in my studies at Monash and I was fortunate to tutor in his course and he said to me are you thinking of writing a master's and I said yes I'm a bit interested in Portuguese Timor and he said you must do it so mm-hmm. that sort of set me off on a on a, 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 a trail but I already had been I must point out set off on a trail be, be, by another aspect of the SCM which was the um, I was a frontier intern in London with the WSCF Europe Africa project and there we had the great pleasure to be taught for two weeks by Paulo Freire uh, the noted Brazilian the noted Brazilian educationalist and this is where I really began to think about the nature of the difference between different types of education which emphasize values and those which don't uh, because as you as Brian rightly points out, the Australian University led us to believe that everything had to be proved, everything had to be scientific. Paolo very cleverly in his bringing together of Marxism and Christianity, I do believe, uh, really inspired a whole generation of educationalists. And when I came to do my PhD in education, I found that it was quite a different uh thing than it had been even when I'd been an undergraduate at Monash. Now, it, there was not open talk about religion, but the whole idea about people having values, expressing them, debating them, uh, and, and slowly I've come around to realise that this is a debate between uh, what, what some people would call a holistic approach and a reductionist approach. And Talking about the reductionist approach to knowledge and education, uh, I'm reminded when I worked for John Langmore in Parliament House that John Langmore used to have a phrase he used, which was economic fundamentalist. (laughs) And I remember thinking, oh, some people mightn't understand what an economic fundamentalist is if they don't understand what a Christian fundamentalist is, or an Islam, what if they don't understand what a religious fundamentalist is? How are they going to understand what a, an economic fundamentalist is? And it struck me that these represent sort of ways of thinking about all areas of knowledge, not just religion, but we see it expressed in religious education because it is about different values and working towards those values. Anyway, I'd better stop there, I think. I I wasn't advocating economic fundamentalism. I was criticising it. Yes. Yes. Oh, I know. You weren't advocating. No, you used to call people economic fundamentalists. Yes, I remember that. And it was true. It was true. I'm not criticising it at all. But it, it suddenly made me wake up that fundamentalism i.e. reductionism, occurs in all areas of knowledge. We see it, we see it, we as SCMers saw it in religion. Thank you very much, Helen. Uh, We'll uh, invite uh, Sandy Yule to comment, please. Uh, Thank you, Robbie. Firstly, secular means of this age. Mm It should be an open question as to where that goes. Does that include the eternal or does it not? Yes. Um, People who assume that it includes, excludes the eternal uh, have simply done that. They have simply made an assumption. So that's my first comment, that I think that the the word secular needs to be interrogated in that sort of way. Uh, it, It means of this age. So we have to be talking to people around what is true in this age. But the question of the basis of which we on which we talk is, I think, quite open. The second thing I want to comment on is really about sovereignty and the question of how that relates to the sovereignty of truth. Uh, there, there is a sense in which I think we should be claiming sovereignty 
for truth. <laughs> uh, and where we have the word sovereignty, it comes from national uh, identities, each of which has its own sovereignty. But because these are human institutions, they uh, always tend to compete and therefore conflict. Yet for Christians, and I think for many religious traditions, um, sovereignty is not of a human level. Sovereignty is from God. Uh, God is you know, represents that which everything else stands on. That there's, there's a sovereignty beyond the human, uh, which limits and shows up the limitations of all human sovereignties. So when we have First Nations people saying we have sovereignty over the land because we have been here for 65,000 years and we know it, uh, that, they've got a very good, very good claim and a very spiritually based claim. And this should not be seen as in, com uh, in competition with the sovereignty of parliament. Uh, each has its own very clear responsibility and separate role. Uh, and it seems to me that the question of, of uh, understanding this uh, has to respect uh, uh, this, this sort of logic that um, we need to be looking for the fundamental realities of things. Um, and uh, most of the assumptions that, that are currently being made uh, don't seem to do that very well in Australia. My, my observation would be that, that I, I think we are up against an increasingly uh, illiterate society in terms of fundamental understanding. Uh, the authority of conscience would be another example of a sovereignty that each individual person is in a sense sovereign over their own conscience. But you can't absolutize that. <laughs> it's just ridiculous to absolutize your own conscience over against everybody else's conscience. Uh, but the uh, element of truth in that is that each person has a voice and the prophetic voice is the sovereign conscience that stands over against an unjust society. Uh, and we need that, not, not for the conflict that it produces, but for the pathway back to truth. Uh, th those are my thoughts in reaction to, to what's been said so far. That uh, uh, I do think there are very fundamental uh, matters here which are hard to talk about. And certainly hard hard to research, but uh, that doesn't mean we shouldn't do it. These are the questions that legitimate and justify public money being spent uh, on uh, on on this area of research. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sandy. I, I mentioned that the uh, I see Ian wants to speak, but I'll just uh, jump in first. Um, the uh, Uluru statement from the heart uh, explicitly raises this. Um, contrast between uh, indigenous sovereignty as a spiritual notion mm -hmm. and uh, the legal sovereignty of the crown. And uh, so I, I think that that uh, reflects the shallowness of much of the uh, conservative criticism of the voice proposal that, you know, people are, uh, are, are critiquing this uh, concept of an indigenous uh, spiritual sovereignty grounded in a millennia of uh, relationship to the uh, to the land and and uh, a spirituality of place, um, and there's there's such a uh, a shallow reaction against against that in some circles, which is really uh, as as so many of these debates around uh, the voice to parliament uh, reflect that there's a very superficial and shallow uh, argument that's uh, that's being presented against it which with a, a more spiritual understanding it's possible to uh, to see uh, the, the problems uh, with with those criticisms so uh, so thank you sandy for uh, for raising that that question of sovereignty now uh, ian wanted to speak um it's it's easy to fall into a sort of dichotomy between what we think ought to be done, and a description of what is done, of what is happening, of what is going on. And we need to be a bit careful about letting those things just fall into opposition between each other, as it were. I'm very mindful of that because um, it seems to me there's another question that's caught up that can help us get beyond that sort of opposition between what ought to be done 
and what is being done at the present time. And one of the things that I found very helpful was the difference in the way that Canada politically thought about itself from the way in which the United States had thought about itself. Canada was remarkably gifted by its inheritance. So 50 kilometers from where I taught at Master University, there was um, a center for the Iroquois people of, of Canada. Uh, there were probably 50,000 hectares of land for um, an Iroquois community center and for uh, programs to build the economies and so on. It was out of this background experience and faced with the reality of the conflict that was there between the French and the English in the formation of Canada, that Canada came up with this extraordinarily inventive notion of multiculturalism which was unlike the increasingly strong move in the United States to think in terms of a melting pot culture, which does enormous damage to the inheritance of human beings. The idea that everybody has to be remade if they're going to be genuinely American. Uh, the first chairman of religious studies at McMaster, uh, Helen, was um, also a person who uh, worked with Paulo Freire. And uh, he came back on a visit to McMaster on his way down to Kernavaca uh, to, to do further work with uh, Paulo Freire, Ibn Illich, and others. I found it interesting that that was a lively discussion in Canada. And it wasn't a discussion in the United States. And it seems to me that the difference that's caught up in that, the difference between multiculturalism and the melting pot model of culture is something that we really need to talk about much more carefully together about how we think about the future of Australia. Because if we don't understand the healing possibilities in multiculturalism, then we are likely to fall into a trap that thinks in terms of multiculturalism, simply in terms of the relative strengths of all of the different political communities that make up the migrant populations of Australia. And that would be very sad and very tragic if that was the way that we went. I, I would love to have had another life to live again in experiencing the nature of Canadian multiculturalism, which Australia opened the way towards and then seemed to close the door on. And there was a chap by the name of John Houston, I think his name was, who came to visit me at Deakin University. And to my astonishment, uh, Houston told me that he had been sent by the Australian government in the early, uh, in the late 1960s, early 1970s, as one of three or four public servants who went to Canada to study the, the legal framework and administrative framework for the management of multiculturalism in Canadian society. This was at a time when Australians, I think, did not understand well enough what a radically different picture of culture was being studied in Canada. And I was very sad that the uh, public servant, as he had been, uh, decided not to come and do a doctoral program with me. Uh, he decided that my uh, suggestion to go and he became the multicultural advisor to the Anglican Archbishop of Melbourne. And, um, and he built a, a more collaborative program that was also shaped by, by his experience of his time in Canada and working in a multicultural setting. 
Canada accepted a view that, for example, any population in a city that hit 100,000 people was entitled to develop a different language program for uh, people from a different language community. So, for example, in Kitchener-Waterloo, when they hit 100,000 German background people, a German language stream was opened up in Kitchener-Waterloo, uh, teaching firstly in German, and then uh, through uh, what went on at, uh, at, in the playground and elsewhere, where people learned their English as well. And so across Canada, there was an institutional framework for building multiculturalism that we didn't open the door to. And we would have, I think, a very different reception of multiculturalism from Chinese and Indian Australians if we were open to that richer view of what multiculturalism opens. Otherwise, I think we will be we will find ourselves reinforcing what we are also criticizing. Maxi, and that's uh, it's an interesting point. Like uh, I hadn't really thought about it in terms of the um, uh, well, the Australian experience uh, had a uh, in the nineteen fifties a strong focus on assimilation, and yes. uh, and uh, particularly with uh, Indigenous people. And uh, and that uh, reflected uh, essentially a contempt for uh, for their cultural difference, and yes. so a, a shift to a high level of respect for uh, for cultural difference is uh, is something that uh, can appear superficially in the trappings of of multiculturalism, yes. but if there isn't really the education about cultural difference, I think that. Brian was talking about, then yes. uh, it does remain at, at quite a superficial level. Thank you. Yes. Yep. Thank you. All right. Now, uh, I had some further comments. Uh, if uh, I think Mandy may have wished uh, to speak. She briefly shared her screen, uh, I think, by accident. But uh, Mandy, we, we don't have you on, on, uh, on visual. But did you wish to speak? Uh no, I, I, I'm sorry, my camera's not working. So I was fiddling with it, Robbie, to try and uh, fix that. Um, look, Helen's comments resonated with me about the comment about reductionism versus holistic thinking. And that that permeates so many areas. I was thinking in the area of the law, um, they say that one side of the brain is very rule-driven, and people, some people relate very much to that rule-driven uh, way of thinking. And the other side of the brain is a bit freer and, and more associative and so on and a bit more creative. And we do see in the law some people who are very rule-driven, some jurists who are very rule-driven, and some who are a bit more conscious of purpose and therefore the purpose of the laws and therefore uh, perhaps that opens them to think about how the law ought to be applied today. So that 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 um, question of reductionism or fundamentalism is one way of putting it, but I think reductionism is quite a useful way of putting it, which um, spells out a bit of a different way of thinking. And of, of course, there's there, that's a binary thing, I suppose. But and and there, most of us are probably on the spectrum in between, and sometimes we're more one than the other. But um, that that idea of being very rule bound, uh, I, I associated with reductionism, versus being a bit more holistic, purpose driven, um, I think carries across many disciplines. Thanks, Mandy. Uh, James. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, I was uh, taken by what Mandy was saying just now, and uh, I found it uh, um, uh, helpful. What I've found extraordinary in that um, 
uh, over the years, um, I've uh, lectured both in theology, not in studies in religion, but in Christian theology, and have found it a lot easier to lecture in Christian theology in the Islamic state educational <laughs> system than in Australia. Um, uh, I've lectured in, in many of the state universities of Indonesia, not in the studies of religion, but in Christian theology, um, and also in many of the Islamic universities, where there is an interest in actually dealing with the theological issue. And when, therefore, one raises uh, in Indonesia the issue of the law in relation to public policy, there are two very clear things which are set out. One is that uh, uh, the Indonesian legal system has a very clear interest in the law and in regulations and indeed interferes in personal life a great deal more than Australian law does. Nevertheless, the Panchasila, which is the uh, state ideology, is seen as culturally above the law and has a semi-religious status. And therefore, in a sense, it is a kind of liberal democracy which stands above the law, much more uh, so is not controlled by that sort of situation. And all my life in this country, I have sought to see that theology, Christian theology, have its place in the life of Australian universities. Um, it started off uh, when I was at Griffith University, when uh, the uh, vice chancellor of the day alerted me to the fact that uh, in Griffith, we were receiving uh, a lot of students for medical degrees uh, and nursing degrees from Malaysia. We'd entered into a contract with, with the Malaysian government. And part of the insistence of the Malaysian government is that all of these medical and nursing students were taught uh, classical Islam, particularly Islamic theology in relation to health. Yes. And the Commonwealth supported this financially. So the Vice Chancellor and I made an appointment with Michael Lavarch and uh, Brian and John Langmore would know which Labour government that was in. Uh, he was Attorney General. And we went to see him and we said to him, look, Attorney, uh, at this point, the Commonwealth is engaging in discrimination against Christianity in that you are financially backing Muslim teaching, which we have no objection to, none whatsoever. We support it, but you are for forbidding that for Christians. And Michael Lavarch sat back for about half an hour and said, uh, because we had suggested that it might be an idea for us to go to the courts to see if this could be tested, the Commonwealth could be tested against the university. Um, and he sat back for half an hour and said, give us six months, please. And we said, why? And he said, because you will win. We have, in fact, discriminated against you without intent. Um, and the... the uh, the way in which the Queensland universities had been set up as a later stage from Sydney and Melbourne meant that there had been nothing in the state act to prevent religious being taught, religion being taught in the Queensland universities. And so we were able to set up a school of Christian theology. Now, because of the church's weakness, that is the weakness of all of the churches, that school fell over. But I replicated the same idea in Charles Sturt University in Canberra. And as far as I know, Charles Sturt University is the only state university, the only public university, still offering theology, apart from the University of Divinity and the Australian Catholic University. That is not studies in religion, not a subset of social science or a subset of history or a su subset of politics, philosophy and economics which of course is perfectly legitimate, but actually allowing uh, religion to speak in its own terms. And this not only in Charles Sturt applies to um, uh, Christian theology, there is also now a school of Islamic theology, which is what we very much wanted. That is to say a fair and open uh, 
discussion uh, of religions from their own basis. And there are also developments uh, with also in that university with Hinduism, um, uh, Sikhism and Buddhism. Um, now, it seems to me that there are two issues that often here are confused in Australia. That is to say, the legal framework of both the Commonwealth and the states on the one hand, and those things which are purely controlled by the constitution and the ethos of society, which are above that. And that certain elements in society, I dislike the word secularism because it's uh, such a fluid word, but nevertheless, those ideas surrounding secularism believe that they have the interpretation of uh, this so-called concept of secularism tied up. They haven't. They haven't. It's a much more fluid concept, but it is partly the weakness of the churches who are pushing the edges of who should be pushing the edges of that. Sadly, currently it's not. The people who are pushing the edges of this are in fact Muslim intellectuals in this country. Now the Gulen movement, which comes from uh, Turkey, uh, is a particular form of liberal Islam, and they are the ones who are pushing this uh, in a most consistent manner and have been quite successful. And it would be a very good thing for the Christian churches to try to have a go at this in the same way. I believe that they have certainly got the, op uh, the, uh, uh, the opportunity. But what is amazing is that uh, certain elements of secularism have persuaded the Christian churches to be cautious, uh, to be cautious and not to push too much at the edges. And therefore, I think what uh, Mandy has said to us um, uh, and the development of that is pretty important for a gathering uh, of the SCM, which stood for that from the very beginning. Thank you very much, James. It's it's wonderful to have you uh, with us, and I, I think your uh, high-level experience with um, Charles Sturt, I think also with the Australian Centre for Christianity and Culture, uh, has um, I just just reflects uh, the difficulty of these debates, and and I think this point about the weakness of the churches is is an interesting one to consider. Thank you. Pleasure. Um, now, I, I wanted to sort of follow up on on that with some uh, some comments uh, from the uh, the uh, let's see where are we? Um, so I'm just interested in what uh, picking up partly on on what James has said and uh, going back to uh, Sandy Yule's comments about what we mean by uh, secular and uh, just looking at the consequences of secularism and uh, one of the themes I've found interesting is uh, the the concept of a hermeneutic of suspicion which is a, a an idea from the philosopher Paul Ricoeur uh, which uh, looks at the you know the great modern scholars uh, Marx and uh, and Freud and uh, just uh, uh, always looking at, at claims um, uh, through this sort of lens of uh, of evidence and, and logic uh, just uh, being suspicious about the truth of claims and, and so that's something that's quite challenging in a religious context where the tradition of religion uh, is uh, rests on um, authority and uh, and the heritage of faith and uh, you know the churches have such a background of uh, of being really quite authoritarian in in their response for example to heresy and and so uh, so churches haven't really welcomed uh, that sort of uh, it was the secular world which was seen as uh, you know opening up the enlightenment uh, you know bringing the sense of modernity and, and that sort of uh, framework uh, still remains r really quite powerful but 
But one of the pro then, then we have to ask, well, what are the problems that have arisen from that uh, that secular focus on evidence lo and logic as as the dominant values? There's been, uh, I suppose, a rejection of intuition of of wisdom, uh, but also there's been a fragmentation within the community that the the role of religion in uh, promoting social cohesion um, has has been lost to some extent and so uh, there are implications in terms of uh, of mental health and uh, relationships and uh, intergenerational uh, uh, communication and, and transmission of of knowledge where uh, we lack those that sort of the civil society that is provided by the church which uh, there isn't really any uh, secular replacement for for the church as a as a basis for civil society but but equally what's happening with the church is is a change in values i think a greater humility that this uh, this debate between secular v sacred came out of a time when when both sides sort of claimed to be absolutist you know they both claimed to hold all of the truth and i think there's a lot more humility in uh within the church uh within well within a lot of the church i, I think that there's still you know the public facing elements of the church tend to want to go back to a, a christendom position which is really quite untenable and so uh, i'm thinking there of the australian christian lobby and the and the catholic uh, bishops and the Anglican uh, bishops, but uh, but I think that there's a, a much more uh, pluralistic view uh, within the churches um, that uh, that is uh, open, as Sandy was saying, to uh, a respect for the secular and which can integrate the secular and the sacred. So anyway, just some thoughts. Now Ian was going to comment, so uh, I'll uh, hand over to Ian and then Rebecca. I think that uh, uh, I spoke before about McMaster University and my experience in Canada. Oops. Um, uh, at McMaster University, uh, when I began lecturing there, uh, we had 110 doctoral students funded to study in world religions in all the major traditions. We had 30 members of the academic staff lecturing in those traditions. Now, that's what it takes to run a genuinely multicultural program at a university that takes seriously educating in a multi-faith and multicultural world. Australia, to my mind, backed away from the possibilities that it saw in Canada. And I think was probably to some extent shaped by the American Civil War and by the view that it's better to have a single form of belief running and organizing a culture. And so we went down the American path of the melting pot, even though we continue to use the word multicultural in a number of occasions and, and situations. Canada faced the real possibility of civil war and chose not to go down that road. It faced the possibility every bit as seriously as the United States did, but it chose not to go down that way and chose instead not to go down a, a view that turned citizens against each other, but enabled them to bring together diversity and different views. And I think if Australia were to be able to reshape what it does in education, that is what it will have to do. And it will have to put money into doing that, uh, serious money. Um, I, I would hope that we would find a way that Charles Sturt would inherit some of that money and that we made it a national 
program, a national center for, for exactly creating that. Thanks, Ian. Let's uh, hear from Rebecca. Hello, everyone. I'm from Robbie and Mandy's generation, and um, Sandy was one of my teachers down at Chum Creek in various camps on Bible studies, and I always love being with you, Sandy, in a group. Um, I wanted to mention, I've written down the question, why should we have religious studies in university as a sort of focus point for what I want to say? And I'm just going to tell a few stories very briefly. My own daughter is 24, and she did come to church when she was young. It's Pitt Street Uniting Church, and it, but she knows that she got a lot of her values from me and my family, but she won't go near a church, and neither will any of the other young people I know. She does like going to her Hindu friend's um, home because they have Diwali and they tell stories. So she actually likes ritual and stories, but there's a pox on anything Christian because of colonialism kind of thing. Um, so, but what I wanted to say spiritually, intellectually, is that conflict resolution relies upon connecting. And um, in my family, we know about Ireland. And I also know a bit about Hungary because I've been over there quite a few times. And of course, we're getting ready for this in Australia now too. So the purpose of teaching stories is so you understand as we know, exegesis and hermeneutics, where did they come from? What was actually happening in the First Testament when those stories were written and what did it mean to the people then? Um, and so I think there's a, like I love James here. I'm a huge student of your work and I believe that my family lives next to your daughter, your family in um, Belfast, etc., which is another story. But the way that you've really dug deeply into Indonesia and um Islam on connections is very important. And so I'm just saying stories is one thing to help with conflict resolution and to help professionally with the, man, the things Mandy was raising. I also just had one other quick story. There's a plane going overhead. Um, I was working in Wesley Mission for six years and in their values course <clears throat> as part of their induction, they taught everyone the story of the, the parable of the Good Samaritan. Now, most people, young or from different ethnic backgrounds, haven't don't even know what a parable is, so to speak, but they found it a very moving story. And why might the people have walked past and not helped? You know, were they busy? Were they tired? Did they have other things on their mind? Or were they just inhumane, etc.? They It was a very skillful digging into the parable. So I'm basically saying we have great riches and there are reasons for it, and I'm. I thought I'd just say those few reasons why I think it's important. Thank you. Robbie, you're on mute. I'm sorry. Uh, I see uh, Renata has joined Brian, and uh, so I'd just like to say welcome to uh, Renata. It's uh, lovely to see you uh, with us. Um, and um, let's see, uh, Sandy, were you wanting to uh, to comment? No, I was really just thinking, Rebecca. That was uh, applause, not not uh, not any thoughtful comment to come. Sorry. Very good. Um, I'm I'm wondering if if Brian or possibly Renata might like to um, share any uh, responses to what we've uh, what uh, to the conversation. Renata hasn't heard very much of the much of the conversation, and as usual, the SCM circles has been very wide ranging. Um, Sandy's point about uh, uh, about words and very important in politics, words tend to be uh, uh, become what people choose to make them mean, and so they they lose uh, that theoretical uh, uh, construct that uh, Sandy was building, uh, which. Uh, um, and when you take the word secular, I tend to secular religious, you know, tend to look at that simple way, I suppose. But uh, in a way, that's, that's, that is at the heart of the problem that we are grappling with. I think the problem is Australia is becoming increasingly more complex a society. And I think in the 1980s, was it, that we kind of came around to recognising 
that we don't just importing a workforce, uh, we're actually importing people, cultural background, who might make a contribution to building a modern Australia. And that was a big change. And I know it may not have been completely sustained. I used to talk to Brian Gallagher about multiculturalism at great length because he's a professor of politics at Melbourne University. And he was a great critic of multiculturalism, which he thought was a very soft and mushy kind of concept and didn't have... I mean, he talked much more about rights and fundamental rights. Uh, and in Australia, we've been very cautious about doing that too. We, we, uh, we've got some state uh, discussions about rights, but we're about to uh, become a republic without really facing up to how old and fashioned the uh, constitution is and so on. Now, there's so many different angles, but I think fundamentally, uh, I think there needs to be a conversation uh, across religions uh, about uh, um, um, the nature of faith and different faiths and, uh, and the implications for society. Because I sense at the moment uh, uh, we've got, uh, we've still got the, the uh, history of denominationalism. Nobody listens much to the Australian Council of Churches. But I think there needs to be some coming together based on religious and cultural history uh, to get more of a conversation about uh, uh, what the values actually mean, you know, what multicultural, what the more fundamental values actually mean for the world today. And uh, it just seems to me that there's a kind of um, uh, acceptance of change on a very big scale. Uh, I'm thinking particularly about immigration, but it's a very big change. And in a sense, we're not talking about it socially and culturally. And that's where the conversa conversation should take place, really at the university. Uh, what's uh, is happening socially and, and what, is happening, what is happening socially and culturally as a result of this change? You know, I think there's a kind of feeling, well, we've just coped pretty well in the past, we'll cope well in the future, but without uh, uh, looking at the fundamentals. And uh, that's why I think uh, in a review of higher education, to ignore what's happening demographically and socially uh, and as a consequence of economics in some way uh, should be faced up to uh, uh, by Minister for Higher Education, at least. Thanks, Brian. Like, I think I feel that that theme of taking multiculturalism seriously opens the question of uh, pluralism and yeah. uh, and dialogue and uh, it it occurs to me that you know one of the one of the features of our colonial inheritance is that um, well the 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 old imperial tradition was that uh, there's one truth which is uh, uh, which comes from the voice of the crown and uh, so you get this uh, this imperial attitude that just completely lacks any respect for for people of of other backgrounds. And I, I feel that that's something that's just very deeply entrenched uh, within Australian uh, culture. And and I see it just particularly in the criticism of the Indigenous voice uh, to Parliament. And uh, so just this uh, this sense that you know actually hearing and listening to uh, to the voices of of people who have a completely different perspective from that dominant imperial tradition is uh, is just unacceptable to the people who, who still hold to that tradition. And so it's that's why it's so important that we uh, uh, validate that uh, respect for diversity. Uh, in the constitution, because uh, unless we do, you know, it's that we still have this, you know, race racist assumption that uh, only the the imperial tradition is is real and and v valid and legitimate. Yeah, I think Barry Jones. Uh, 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 I asked Barry Jones once about why is it that Australians think that you've only been dealt with squarely. Uh, as at football games and other sporting events, as long as somebody has won. Why, why have we decided that 
that sort of competition is the only kind of interaction that makes recreation meaningful. Why do we have to think? What has led us to think that only a competition that leads to a winner is a positive competition? Hmm. Good question. Brian? I was thinking about Barry and the Constitution and uh, the Republic, and you know, Barry finally got around to saying, well, fundamentally, it's the Constitution that's the problem. And uh, we're going to uh, the solution before we've really uh, gone to the more fundamental issue. And I, I think that's really interesting. When it's an ongoing discussion that's going on, it's, it's, got, it's got to be taken to what is fundamental as opposed to, you know, this notion of Australia as a head of state is kind of a very superficial idea and basically wouldn't change much and the Governor-Generals weren't all that bad anyway and they weren't all that good either. Um, but it seems to me that fundamentally uh, what we're talking about is in a changed society, how do we get a cross-cultural conversation going, which has got a religious element, but cross-cultural, but also a religious conversation. So we should be reaching out to uh, Islamic and to, uh, uh, you know, to the other religious cultures and, and trying to encourage a, a conversation that is uh, a deeper conversation because it doesn't attack the uh, uh, participants. It builds on the, what the participants bring to the table. Thanks. So th that implies that the, uh, the the secular culture has been partly responsible for that sort of monolithic uh, approach. Hmm. Yeah. yeah. Thanks, Brian. Uh, Sandy. Yeah, what, what's come to me from this conversation is that we, we lack a deep understanding of what it is to be a human being uh, as a kind of underpinning of our conversations so that people are interpreted as representing their community rather than as speaking as people so the whole sense of uh, human uh, formation of character <laughs> is actually in question we don't have a very clear idea of what we're trying to form when we try to form good human character and i, I just think that the fundamental questions have not been articulated so therefore we we're, we are operate in ignorance of them <laughs> um, and Brian keeps saying, treat these recent migrants as people, not just as you know representatives of being Indian or whatever. Uh, that, that's the the comment I'd like to think more about. So just to identify that as a, a key issue, that fundamental uh, uh, questions about our reality as uh, as people, as a society, uh, as inhabitants of this land, all of those things, it gets to be too wishy-washy to discuss in the public forum. That's the problem. But unless we have ways of uh, nurturing and addressing the formation of people better, um, we'll still not make a lot of progress. Uh, that's what I'm thinking at the moment. Thank you. Thanks, Sandy. Uh, Helen. Oh, sorry, Mandy. Oh, could I just say there are some great things happening in terms of openness uh, to answer Brian um to other faiths and in new south wales reverend manus gosh is the uh, chair of the interfaith commission of the new south wales ecumenical council and his watchword is really friendship and he has built incredible friendships across all the different uh faiths over many years uh and the warmth of it is just wonderful to know about we did an interview with him on SCM. It's on a YouTube, and there are some great visuals, some photographs collected, and you see through that he talks about the theology of it and also the practice of it and some of the photos that just show the friendship. So I think uh, partly that comes back to Sandy's point and also yours, Brian, about humanity, recognising our common humanity and understanding that and building on it, and that's really that, that friendship is a big part of that, not just labelling people as other. <laughs> so true. Thank you, Mandy. Um, and uh, Helen. Uh, yes. Now, there was a couple of things. Yes, just building on what uh, 
Mandy said, one of the things that I was able to do when I went to Victoria University, which you couldn't have done at any other university because it was so new, was to bring in a course called Asia Pacific Community Development. And we, we had a number of overseas students, but the Australian students that we got into that course were an extraordinary bunch of people with uh, very different backgrounds and careers. Many of them had studied overseas. Some of them were from different cultural communities. And we really, in the fieldwork, had the most extraordinary experiences and visited religious communities and other we you know we tried to I tried to get them to to do research and field work in first and second year undergraduate you know which is almost unheard of in in other universities and um you know it just struck me that in a sense we did get a bit of an SEM going there at one time unfortunately I don't think it continued but the whole idea of trying to transform the content of university education is top priority, I do believe, bringing together theory and practice and making a storytelling, exactly what Rebecca was talking about, becomes a major part of the course. One of the people that's now teaching a course I set up is, is Andrew Hewitt, the former head of Oxfam. And I invited him to take it over because he had so many stories to tell and students can read the books and read the proper text, but they want to hear stories about how people relate. And I think the concept of multiculturalism is, is growing in Australia. I've always thought it it lacked a component of religion in it. In fact, multiculturalism in Australia sort of ignored the fact that everybody's got to really understand all the major religions practiced there or they'll never be able to fully understand it. Um, now, um, oh, well, oh, yes. Now, the other thing I just wanted to make a comment about is differences within Australia because when we talk about we think this we, 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 I've become recently, because I'm out of touch with Australia living here in Timor, I joined a Facebook group called Christians for Labor. Now, very interesting, that Facebook group is run from New South Wales. And it's given me a huge insight into the difference of both religion and politics in New South Wales and Victoria, I think. And I do believe it's because of the history. And if it was a South Australian product, I think it would be, again, quite different. You know, we have, you know, we have the New South Wales right and we have the Sydney Anglican Diocese being, you know, a little bit on their own, possibly within the Commonwealth of Australia. I do believe for historic reasons, although I'm not a historian, I couldn't begin, you know, um, Renata would know more about this than me, but... But I think that the way religion was used in the early settlement of Australia, particularly those convict colonies, as an instrument of social control, whereas in other places, religion was probably an influence of, of um, cultural expression so that, you know, it had different roles in different parts of Australia as I mean, this is just a hypothesis. I don't know what other people think about this. As I said, I'm not a historian, uh, but I would be interested to know other people's views. I'd like to come back to Brian's um, comment about the review that uh, Minister uh, Jason Clare is uh, conducting of uh, Australian universities and uh, Brian's observation that it's... Uh, writing instructions seem to be very uh, instrumental, you know, just saying that universities exist as a means to the end of um, promoting economic growth. I suppose that's that's one way of taking it in a you know, fully reductive way. Uh, whether, it, whether it actually is that reductive, I'm not sure. Like uh, your colleague, uh, John Dawkins, uh, uh, had uh, something of that uh, reputation uh, back in, in in your day, uh, Brian, in in government, and uh, and so there has been that that criticism of, uh, you know, that what's what are universities for, and uh, you know what's the risk of uh, that very narrow instrumental 
philosophy um, uh, in in terms of uh, social cohesion and identity. So uh, you know those are, those are some uh, things that uh, I, I wonder how uh, Minister Clare's uh, review will uh, be open to those sorts of questions. Hmm. All right. Um, let's see. I, I, we're uh, we're coming towards the end of our our time. Uh, so, uh, uh, um, Brian, do you have uh, any any comments at this point? Well, there's been, uh, I mean, one, one does not need to talk to him, really. I mean, I, I think uh, uh, it would be good, given the breadth of conversation we've had today. Uh, to perhaps uh, make a bit of a summary and then pick out of that four or five points that uh, one might put to the minister and you could put to the minister maybe in a letter or something like that and request a, a meeting and have a discussion about uh, uh, some of the issues that we've been talking about today. I mean, that's the minister's job to listen to what uh, communities think and this is one community that's uh, full of ideas and he may, may appreciate uh, the opportunity to talk about uh, uh, the, and the place of religion within, uh, within universities, particularly if he thinks it's important culturally and important in terms of the way Australia is moving. That's why I tried to make an argument for trying to think strategically, why would the minister be interested in talking about uh, religion? Well, I don't think the minister would be, especially, but he might be interested in talking about uh, religion the way we've talked about in this conversation. I think uh, it's been a very valuable conversation and there are many strands to it. And so it's important for someone or a couple to sit down and say, well, which were the more important strands that say uh, Minister Clare might be interested in? Well, we'll, we'll be putting the uh, recording of the conversation up uh, as a, a public uh, YouTube recording, so um, that will be available, and I, I will uh, certainly write up a, uh, a a discussion on it, which I'll, I'll share with uh, everyone who's attended and uh, and with others. Um, and uh, I think it it leads back to uh, your original uh, question, Brian, of whether the secular university has uh, has had its day. I, I was going to say. I got confused at one point whether it was whether the question was has the secular university lost its way, or or has it had its day? I, I suppose they're they're quite similar uh, questions. But um, uh, what's what's your uh, what's your feeling about the the answer to the question in the light of the the conversation we've had? I think uh, I think the original formulation is uh, had its day. It's got uh, it's got a bit of piquancy. I don't see why we shouldn't use that uh, that kind of uh, language. I think uh, I think the need to uh, to be a bit radical. I think, in a sense, to uh, uh, to be critical and uh, but not to talk about everything. I mean, that's why we need to, to narrow it down to questions around. Uh, the changing nature of the population, the changing shifting cultures, the problem of uh, um, how those cultures contribute to our society, I suppose, and you know, how they uh, and where religion fits in with that. I mean, I, I think I see religion and culture as inseparable, and uh, and I think uh, culture is a very good way to get at religion in terms of the political class. So I suppose I tend to frame it in that way because I thought that uh, the political class should be worried about what the social and economic implications are of the very big shift that's occurring in Australia in terms of the nature of this community. That seems to me that's a fundamental question that education needs to consider and higher education. But as uh, people are saying, it, it requires a more holistic approach, not one that's too narrow. Want to be about humanity, not about uh, economic growth and so on. I think one of the problems with the word multiculturalism is it takes the um, the tension or the conflicts out of the 
the issue, you know. It seems as though, you know, we can all get used to and live to, together, accepting everything, you know, whereas that's just not the case. And I think multiculturalism is a bit of a problem as a word to describe it, to describe relationships, yes. Yes, uh, the universities have a responsibility to uh, promote uh, honest dialogue where uh, people's differences can be aired in a respectful way so that we can learn from each other. Uh, David. Um, yeah, very interesting discussion. Um, I think we haven't really... Well, of course, today we haven't really talked about what Christianity is. You'd have to do a, a three-year BCL to work that out. Uh, but I think largely for the ordinary person sitting in the pews, the religion is more a tribal thing. This is a group we belong to. Um, and we don't necessarily need to understand what the religion's about at all. It's just that we're here with all our friends and this is great. Um, and as, as more and more Chinese and Indians and all other people coming to Australia, we get more and more of these siloed groups who probably don't understand their own religion any more than we do, but they all what they do know is that they belong to it and they're the ones who are right. Don't quite know where all that goes. <laughs> yes, and I, I, I think, David, that that, uh, illustrates a need for, uh, I think, what James was commenting about the role of theology. And uh, I think going back to the comments that both Ian and Brian were making about the, the work of uh, Max Charlesworth uh, many decades ago uh, to uh, bring together philosophy and theology uh, as uh, is, is just really important because, you know, there's been such a dominant a tradition within the philosophy departments of atheism that has really been quite condescending towards any uh, uh, spiritual sympathies. And it's really quite excluded just such vast realms of human heritage and experience from uh, the, uh, the study of wisdom, which is, uh, I think, uh, you know, reflects something of a shallowness in, uh, in Australian uh, cultural traditions. So this uh, the, uh, bringing philosophy uh, into the picture uh, of of saying, you know, what's the meaning of of, of theology, and uh, you know, can we can we actually have a theology that is uh, integrated with uh, modern secular understanding uh, in the terms that Sandy was uh, was describing? Now that's a, a very controversial thing because, as you say much religion is is tribal and you know people enjoy the emotional comfort of, of ritual without really thinking about the the deeper ideas but then it's it's the deeper ideas that are essential to identity and uh, and direction and uh, and values and uh, so uh, so opening up uh, those uh, deeper questions uh, it, it seems is uh, 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 is a challenge to the uh, secularity of the Australian university uh, system, and uh, at, at least to you know many of the the assumptions that have been a, a big part of Australian culture through the uh, the university uh, environment. James. Um, can you hear me? Yes. Um, yes, I would only want to add, going on from what um, Brian was saying, I think that um, it is important that um, an organization like the SCM or any group of concerned citizens make their, make their contribution to the discussion that has been initiated by Minister uh, Clare. Uh, because what I noticed... Um, what I very much noticed when I started teaching in universities in Indonesia is that the Indonesians really saw their universities primarily as dealing with the question, who are we as a people? 
Who are we as a nation? What's the point of there being Indonesia at all? Um, what we have had the nerve, the, the audacity to create ourselves as a nation. And despite all the pitfalls and all the mistakes that the Indonesians have made over the years, and they fully acknowledge them, the fundamental question for the universities is, who are we? What are we as a people? We tend in this country to a very instrumental view of universities. What can they do for us? Uh, what can they do for us? And who's going to pay for them? And in what way are they going to be paid for? But they are highly instrumental questions. Yet, at the heart of Australian universities, I've always noticed that if we have amongst our people, people who go on to get a Nobel Prize, for example, like the current Vice Chancellor of the ANU in Canberra, Brian Schmidt, um, primarily became well known because he won the no or shared in one of the Nobel Prizes. When one of our own gets a Nobel Prize in the university, we are immensely proud and curious about why that happened. We are very interested in why it happened. Um, and we're interested, I think, because underlying it is not just the instrumental question, but the identity question of who we are and how it, and how it expresses who we are as a people. And therefore, I think that a minister in any government will be interested in exploring the question, is this review of higher education primarily an instrumental review? Is it merely a question of how do we pay for this thing and who pays for it? Do we pay for it as a community or do we pay it in an individualistic way, more along the American style of things? Or, uh, and what do we want to use it for? Not simply the instrumental question. Those, of course, are necessary questions, like it or not. But the question now, is it something about us? Because I think that often we have aspirations of a philosophical nature about our society, but we frequently get pulled down by the pragmatic question and uh, by the pragmatic questions. And so we need to look at them both, the aspirational questions and the pragmatic questions. And my experience is that governments will very much want to take up those issues. And therefore, I think it's our duty to make our contribution to this conversation. Thank you, James. Uh, Sandy. Uh, yes, <clears throat> the question of our identity, it seems to me, is an important one to frame. And uh, in terms of Christian identity, I've always said our lives are hid with Christ in God. That is, we don't know. <laughs> uh, that identity is somehow before us and we're in the process of growing up into it. And similarly for our national identity, that I think our identity as Australians is ahead of us. We haven't yet managed to integrate with the, the real Australians, the old Australians, but we're trying. Uh, we've got so many newcomers from so many parts of the world that unless we have some more intentional ways of growing together well, uh, we're going to flood the opportunity that we have to, to be something really special and interesting for the rest of the world, a place that has managed to integrate good things from all, the, all over the world. Uh, I mean, our identity is ahead of us. It's not, it's not something we should fall back into out of some tri uh, tribal loyalty because it's too too bitsy, too various, and 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 I think also um, uh, flawed. So the important thing to me about this debate is really how will our universities uh, catch a vision to navigate us well towards this future identity uh, that we we aspire to. Thank you. We're coming to the end of our uh, time. We. Uh, uh, plan to finish it at six. So I'll invite uh, Brian and Ian to make any final comments. Well, I thought uh, Sandy's uh, summing up there was uh, fantastic. I, I think that's, uh, I think we are not yet. And 
I think that's a very important point. I think we have uh, an opportunity to uh, to steer and shape uh, the future that's uh, emerging, uh, but uh, that means uh, uh, fundamental values, religion is very important in that discussion. And uh, I think uh, it's a very good question for the minister, uh, is the way that you've formulated your review, excluding some very important questions that should have been a fundamental part of uh, a review such as the one that you're heading up. I think uh, if we could do those two things, that'd be pretty good, I think. Pretty good outcome. Thanks, Brian. Ian? I agree with uh, what Brian has just said and very much would like to underline what uh, Sandy Hill and James said in leading up to that point in our conversation. It's a very good point from which to go on. Yeah. Very good. Thank you. Very good. Well, uh, we'll uh, bring our uh, meeting to a, a close, and I'd just like to uh, especially thank um, Brian Howe uh, for uh, having the original uh, idea and uh, and then presenting it so uh, uh, so well, and uh, and uh, thank uh, Ian Weeks for uh, equally uh, contributing to. Uh, uh, Making us think about these uh, these basic big issues, and and finally, just everyone who's uh, joined in the discussion. It's been great, and uh, really appreciate uh, the sharing of of views and and uh, and thinking about directions. So uh, we'll uh, we'll bring uh, bring it to a close at that point, and uh, just. Uh, uh, have really appreciated the discussion. Thank you. And thank you probably for your leadership of this discussion. You've steered us to a, an interesting place. Thank you. <laughs> Very good. All right. Bye bye. Hi. Hi, Hi, everyone. God bless. Thank you for the discussion. Thank you. you want to say something?